Well, tonight, we're going to be doing a little talk on summarizing two words for this whole sermon. And this, I'm going to go through this little preemptory thing here before we get into the opening prayer, and we'll start then with the uh, sermon. But we're going to talk tonight about gospel clarity. This is something that I feel every, everyone who is in the ministry and everybody who is in the church feels the gospel around you. You feel it from the people that's there. If you've never heard the word synergy, synergy is multiplying the feeling from a group of people in an, an area or a space. When we have 25, 30 people in here, I absorb the synergy from those 30 people and I only hope and pray that that synergy is coming from God Almighty above. And as long as that happens and continues to come down, everything's going to be fine for all of us, each and every one of us. Well, unfortunately, clarity hasn't always been most Petra's strong suit. Well, it's actually been said that too many of us are like Christopher Columbus. When we started out, we didn't know where we were going. When we got there, we didn't know where we were. And when we got back, we had no idea of where we'd been. And that's kind of what happens every time that you allow the, the gospel itself, which uh, Daryl read for me so eloquently with 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that is the gospel. That's what we build our whole foundation around. Well, here's the thing about the gospel. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian because gospel understanding and clarity can be easily lost. What I mean by that is so many other things may clutter our minds. And who in this room, I don't need a show of hands, you know yourself. But during this time of COVID-19, everybody in this room has gone through things other than what they had set out to initially do. And it continues to be something that stays uppermost in our mind. And all we want to do is do what's right. That's the thing that we're looking for to do. What I mean by that is that there are so many things that clutter our mind, hearts, and lives, that we forget about the gospel, thinking all that while that we've not strayed from it. We may get focused on what it means to be good parents, to have a good marriage, or the best way to make an impact on the world. All good things of counsel. But we get so focused that we slowly and inadvertently drift from the all-important gospel of grace. And that drift from the gospel is usually a subtle drift. You didn't just wake up this morning and say, well, I don't think I'm going to follow the gospel anymore. Okay, But it happens over time. Time is our worst enemy. We can't get back what's gone and past. You're going to find out tonight that, that's, that we refer to that more as news, and news can't be changed. News has happened about something in the past. <clears throat> and it kind of looks like this. Initially, the gospel is accepted. Then the gospel is assumed we get to the point where we just assume that it's there for us. Then the gospel is confused. And finally, the gospel is lost. 
Honestly, some of us just aren't paying all that much attention. Now, Paul uses the word gospel 11 times in six chapters. He says it five times in the first 11 verses. That means you better know what the gospel means. So before we dive into verses 6 through 9 in Galatians, where Paul gives us some gospel reactions, let me start out by giving you some gospel distinctions and distinctives. What the gospel is, it's the good news. It's what God has done for sinners. The word for gospel is euagileon, and it means announcement. It means news. Please don't ask me to say that again. I lucked out on that one. So, God's gospel is the good news about what God has already done for sinners. Now, just so you know, you and I do not live the gospel. You'll hear people say all the time, I'm just trying to live the gospel. You can't live the gospel. And why not? Because it's news. You don't live news. When it came to you, what if I came to you and said, I'm going to live out the headline story I saw on the 10 o'clock news last night. And you're going to tell me then, well, Jack, that's impossible because that's news. That's already happened. There's no other way to share news except in written or verbal form. Can you imagine turning on the 10 o'clock news and they just show you random people walking around Moving, hello, how are you? I'm fine, we're doing great, we're doing good, all is well. Would that be boring or what? And you would have no idea of what they were trying to put across to you, or get what the idea is that you're trying to get to you. Give the news and if necessary, use words. Listen, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a verb. It's a noun. It's not something to be done. It's something to be known and believed. So it must be communicated in words. We find the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And I'm not going to read it again because Richard did a great job on it. And I, I, I mean, I'm sorry, Daryl did a great job on it. And I, I don't want to drown you too much with reiteration. However, while we're talking about the gospel, let's just flip over to Galatians, which is just a few pages away from 1 Corinthians. All right, where'd my sticky go? There it is. I cheat. I use stickies. And we're going to turn over to Galatians, which is just a few pages away. And we're going to look at Galatians 1 through 4. Now, in Galatians, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Verse 3, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. And verse 5, To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> if you're a definition person, you might like this definition of the gospel by Mr. Ed Stetzer. He says, the gospel is the good news that God, who is more holy than we can imagine, looked upon with compassion people who are more sinful than we would possibly admit and sent Jesus into history to establish his kingdom and reconcile people and the world to himself. Jesus, whose love is more extravagant than we can measure, came to sacrificially die for us so that by his death and resurrection, 
we might gain through his grace what the Bible defines as new and eternal life. The gospel is an announcement of what God has done in Christ for sinners to be saved. So what do we do with the good news? Well, we can share it. We proclaim it. We declare it. That's what we're called to do with good news. And you know what makes this news so unbelievably good? It's rooted in God's grace. Grace is receiving something that you absolutely didn't earn, deserve, or even expect. It'd be like me walking over to Gary and giving him a $20 bill. Well, he's going to love me for life then. He's going to, that would be 10 gallons of ice cream, I think, or something, whatever the rate is. But, so it's, it's very important. When the gospel, what the gospel does require is faith and repentance. It's all over the pages of Scripture. And I'm going to go through several of them here. Uh, in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Are you with me? Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Now, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Verse 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And if you look in Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And it tells us, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We take a look at Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Acts Chapter 17, verse 30. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And it tells us, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Do you think we're getting enough warnings? I think so. Do you think we should pay attention to those warnings? I think so. Do you think that after this evening, everybody can start open their eyes and get back into looking at what the gospel really is? I know so, because we're that kind of people. That's what we do. When you hear the gospel, or in other words, and Paul is telling the people of Athens, in the past, God overlooked ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Repentance is realizing that I'm a wretched sinner and hating my sin and being thoroughly disgusted by my sin and realizing I don't deserve to be in the presence of a holy God. How many of us have ever been there? I don't think you would be here tonight if you hadn't been there at some point in time. And in repentance, you change your mind about your sin, and you hate it, and you get away from it, knowing that you are forgiven. Repentance and faith are really two sides of the same coin. Repentance is turning away from sin, and faith is turning to sin. Uh, is turning to the truth, trusting in and relying on Christ. Repentance is not a work any more than faith is. 
In repentance, we simply renounce our sin, and in faith, we rely on Christ. But the gospel requires a personal response from people who want to be saved. Faith and repentance. There is no saving faith without repentance. Just as there is no true repentance without saving faith. These are required for those to be saved. What, is, what does the gospel produce? The gospel, when you take it in and allow that Holy Spirit to flood you, it creates obedience to God's commands. 1 John 2, chapter 3, 5. 1 John 2, verses 3 and 5 tells us, and hereby do we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. This is how we know we're living in him. Obedience is the evidence you love God and have believed the gospel. Now, in just a bit, we're going to see from Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul gives us some gospel reactions. He gives us some reactions that were happening in the Galatian churches and one that he wanted to happen in the Galatian church. Paul, on his first missionary journey through southern Galatia, was winning hundreds and hundreds of Gentiles to Christ with the gospel of grace. He established churches in each of those cities. But just as the young Christians were getting established in the freedom of the faith, some Jewish teachers or Judaizers came from the mother church to Jerusalem to teach these Gentiles that their faith and salvation weren't complete unless it was accompanied by obedience to the Old Testament law. In the Jewish faith, you were either Jewish or other. That's the way it was. And if you wanted to accept the faith and have Christ as your salvation to be down for your future, then you had to become Jewish. That's what they were trying to tell them all. In other words, they said, you may have believed in Jesus Christ. That's fine. That's good. But you can't have full salvation and complete assurance unless you add to it the observance of the Old Testament law. Especially at stake was the practice of circumcision. It was a visual symbol of the covenant between God and his people. So in essence, those Judaizers, they were teaching these Gentile believers that in order for them to be Christians, they had to be Jews too. And the attack was powerful, and it was persuasive. And those young believers were, fault, were uh, teetering on exactly what makes a person right with God. Paul uses pen and paper to remind them and clarify for them once again what the true nature, what the true nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. So let's take a look at Galatians verse 6. We're going to look at actually 6 through 9, but we'll start with 6. Okay, that one we're going to go to the left from where you're at. That's Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. And it says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Gee, it sounds to me like somebody fell off the wagon there. So 
a gospel reaction is saying that, number one, it's a desertion of the gospel. I marvel that this is verse 1 through uh, verse 6, that we are so removed from him that called into the grace into another gospel. I can't help believe, but believe that Paul might have in mind here the Israelites in the Old Testament. Paul accuses the Galatians of doing the same thing that the Israelites did at the foot of Mount Sinai. You remember that God had freed the Israelites out of the bondage of Egypt. They didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. God just did it. God has shown them so much of his love, power, and grace, and how all-powerful he was. They'd seen the power of God in the plagues. They've experienced the salvation of God with the blood over their doorposts. You remember that they saw the Red Sea open up in front of them when they were being chased, and they walked across on dry ground. They saw the sea walls then crash back together, drowning their enemies who were pursuing them. Out in the desert, God showed them his care, his tenderness, and his grace by raining down from heaven food called manna. I think that was kind of like Old Testament angel food cake. So I don't know. I've never eaten. Have you ever eaten manna, Georgian? <laughs> I, I know you, uh, you've been over there before, and I just wondered if they might have told you something about it. <laughs> okay. They drank water from a rock. My God, how much does it take? What does it take to get through people's mind that we have an all-powerful God and he looks over us and he provides for us and he doesn't ask but for us to just believe in him. That's all. Repent for our sins. Ask for forgiveness. <clears throat> the Bible says that their clothes and their shoes didn't show any signs of wear and tear. These Israelites experienced the real personal salvation, love, and grace of God, which was undeniable. But what did they do? Well, when Moses went up on the mountain to commune with God and get the Ten Commandments, what did they do? If you look in your Bible, and don't look tonight, I, this is a homework, you can do it at home because it would get too lengthy for us. But go to Exodus 32, verses 1 through 10. Moses was up on the mountain quite a few days. I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. And the people panicked. They thought he had died. Suddenly, they wanted to take matter in their own hands. What happens when we take things out of God's hands and put them in our own hands? Everything sort of goes down the tube. And that's exactly what started to happen. What did they do? When the people saw how long it was taking Moses, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, Take the gold rings from the ears of your wives, sons, and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took them and brought them to Aaron, and he took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O oh Israel, these are gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. What were they doing? They are deserting God. They were going back to their old ways. They were going to leave the grace of God and go back into the bondage they'd been brought out of. Can't you just hear Paul saying, you're just like the Israelites and their stupid golden calf. I could just visualize him saying it. And, and, and I know he would have said it from his heart. You're turning quickly from freedom to bondage. You're turning from grace to idolatry and slavery. We sing that old song that's so true, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. All of us have potential, don't we? We are prone 
to rely on the works of our own hands and our own lives rather than trust the finished work of Christ. Listen, folks, if you today are depending on anything other than the grace of God revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to make you right with God, you've deserted God. You are believing a different gospel, and that gospel has no power to save you. Here's another gospel reaction called perversion of the gospel. Look in Galatians 1, chapter 7, or I'm um, chapter 1, verse 7. All right, where'd it go? I lost it already. Galatians 1, verse 7, and it tells us. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. I mean, this always amazes me. I, I hope it amazes everyone here tonight. How these words were written thousands of years ago, and they still pertain to us today. I, it just blows me away every time that I see it and then see the condition of the world and where we're at. <clears throat> now, go back up to the top of your notes. And, look, we started with what the gospel is. It's the good news of the grace of God and Jesus Christ. His life, death, and resurrection. That's where it starts. And if you reverse that, what do you start with? You start with your obedience. Or you start with your good works. If you start the so-called gospel with your good works, your good deeds, your good attitude, your good anything, what's that called? It's called legalism. And that's exactly what the Judaizers were teaching. They were reversing the gospel order, and when you reverse that, you have no gospel at all. It doesn't start with you. It starts with Christ and Christ alone. Well, I was thinking this week about the number of gospel perversions that we see today, and I'm, I'm just going to talk about a couple of them real quick here. So, and I think we can identify with them. The first one is the believe and succeed gospel. Some call this the prosperity gospel. This prosperity gospel is being preached on television and radio, by a host of false prophets who tell you to send money to them and God will bless you with more money. Then they laugh all the way to the bank. In this prosperity gospel, God is seen as a divine vending machine. You put in faith and out pops blessings. Money, homes, cars, health. God exists to make you healthy and wealthy. Well, there's a Greek word for that. It's called hogwash. And it always will be. That will never change. The second one is the deal of the day gospel. The messages in these are that we ought to be able to make a deal with God. It's usually recognized by a prayer like this. And how many times have you either heard this or done it yourself? God, if you'll just get me out of this mess, I'll give my life to you. Or God, if you'll just heal me, I'll serve you forever. Or it may be a bargain like this. God, if you'll let me get this job, win the lottery, date this guy, marry that girl, this, then this is what I'll do for you. Ever heard that or seen it? I, I, if I asked for a show of hands and you were honest, I think every hand in this room would go up. Okay. Sometimes people buy into this let's make a deal mind fest, mindset and they bail out on God when they think he hasn't kept his end of the deal. But you know what? You can't bargain with our creator. You cannot, never will be able to. You can ask for his blessings, but you cannot expect them to be there. 
God answers all prayers. He may not answer them when you, he, when you want the answer, but he will answer it. And sometimes no answer is the answer. Now, there's the smorgasbord gospel. That one's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. These are people who pick different parts of different religions and make their own. It's called syncretism. People take part of Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, and Kabbalah, and Eastern mysticism that they like, and they put them together and say, this is what I believe. Listen, if you're going to make your own religion, you better make your own heaven, too. Because you're not going to God's. If you plan on going to God's heaven, you will have to go God's way. And that's the way of grace. Then there's the at-your-convenience gospel. This one I call the kind of 7-Eleven gospel, if you will. Some congregations in the U.S. are hearing a form of gospel light where sin and repentance are seldom mentioned because it might offend the listener. At gospel light churches, the Bible isn't really preached. There's just a brief devotional, short and sweet, just make people feel good about themselves, feel good about their life, feel good that they're doing the best they can. Don't drag anyone down by making them feel convicted about sin or burden for the lost. Listen, I don't know about everybody in this room, but I know me. If I create a sinful situation that I'm in, guess what, folks? That's my fault. That's not your fault. That's not God's fault. That's my fault. I did it. I accept responsibility for it. I ask for forgiveness. And then I go on from there. And that's what you have to do in your life also. Don't blame it on others. Keep it on yourself. The truth is, if we're not really careful and diligent to know the real gospel, these perversions can creep into our thinking. You may not swallow them hook, line, and sinker. But once you start nibbling on the beliefs, you miss out on the true gospel. Don't ever add or subtract from the gospel because if you do, you're going to lose it completely. The number three is assertion of the gospel. To assert something means to claim, declare, affirm, or emphasize. And that's what Paul is trying to say to these Galatian believers about the gospel of grace. He's saying, you must get back to grace and claim, and declare, and affirm, and emphasize the real gospel. In Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9, the point is clear. No matter how, I'm going to read them in just a second. Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9. The point is clear. No matter how good or how godly a messenger may be, if his gospel does not square with the God-given apostolic doctrines of being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, do not believe it. The truth always outranks a person's credentials. Well, let's look at uh, Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9. Why did my book, my, my Bible keeps turning back by itself. I don't know why it does that. All right. Got lots of time to look them up tonight. Sure, and that more. There we go. Galatians one, verses eight and nine. And they read But though 
But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you other than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you other than that ye have received, let him be accursed. <clears throat> it's, there's a word, and some of your Bibles may say, let him be accursed. And that's okay. It's the same difference, a little different wording. But there's a word for being accursed. And that word is anathema. It means devoted to destruction. You know what that means. It means let him go to hell. Why? Because we assert, we claim, we declare, we affirm, we emphasize the only gospel that can free someone from sin and make them right with God is the gospel found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Every other proclaimed gospel is not gospel at all and leads people away from God and to hell. Two times the Bible uses this word, anathema. And these are the two things that God has devoted to destruction in the New Testament. There are two things the New Testament says can be reasoned to go to hell. The two anathemas are, number one, anyone who teaches a false gospel. It comes from Galatians 1 verse 8. We just read it. Do you know what the other is? This is going to shock you a little bit, but I'm going to read it to you. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. Verse 22 says, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. This is from the King James Version. So, if any man loves not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, or accursed. Those who do not have Jesus can go to hell, and they will. That's guaranteed. That's a dead-on promise. You either accept Christ, get him into your life, do his will, or you won't be in the good place. It's probably going to be the bad place. 